and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host today, Pat McGuffin, and with me today is Jonathan Evans, who is currently the city manager of the wonderful city of Payne City in uh, Polk County, Florida. So welcome uh, in being with us today. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Jonathan Evans. I'm the city manager for the city of Payne City. I've had the opportunity to serve in that capacity for three years. Came as the assistant city manager. The commission then appointed me September 19th as the city manager and I've had a great time since. So we're a full service city. We offer water, wastewater, police fire services. So it's definitely something that I've enjoyed. I went to the University of Central Florida with the opportunity to pursue a career in municipal government and I've been very fortunate and blessed to be in the organization that I'm in today. Well, good. Well, good. We're so glad that you would join us today. I know some of your comments will be about Haines City, and some of them will be good for our viewers to listen to about life in cities and counties in general. So today our focus is on civic affairs and uh, what are the challenges of civil engagement. So when we say civic engagement, what is that comment all about? When we talk about civic engagement, it's the participation from the community to get involved in their government. The challenges that we face as a country, as a community, definitely needs the feedback and the input and the assistance from those that reside in our communities. As municipal employees, we don't have the market captured on intelligence. We want input. We want feedback. We want to know how we're doing because we are servants. You know, the Bible talks about Christ as a servant leader and us as government employees, we want to lead by example. We want the input and feedback to know how we're doing, how we continue, continuously strive to make our communities better. President Reagan articulated how important it is for us to move to be that shining city on the hill. And that's what we've tried to do in Haines City. But I think every community across the nation is trying to be that shining city on the hill. But we need our community to get involved, get engaged, and participate in the dialogue so we can formulate a good, cohesive team so we can tackle the challenges that our communities face in the 21st century. That's good. Now, help me, if you will, unpack this word civic engagement and get in, involved. Um, uh, when you say that, normally people think that means run for office, but there's many ways of being involved. What are some of the ways someone could get involved in their city or county? Well, in most cases, most cities have advisory boards, so there's opportunities to participate on advisory boards. There's also opportunities for neighborhood cleanups, ride-along programs with law enforcement. We recently have started a program that we call Bibles and Badges, where we are engaging our pastoral community to go out with our law enforcement officers to engage the community in a way that we haven't experienced in a long time. One of the things that uh, my administration did is we started a program calling Taking It to the Streets, where we actually knocked on residents' doors to ask them, what can we do to provide better services? And invariably, the remarks that we got was, thank you so much for coming to our house. This is the first time in 28 years somebody's been to my home to talk about local government. So I think there's some opportunities to really share what government does, similar to Christ's time on earth when he was out there with his disciples talking about the ministry and the importance of faith and religion and how that plays into, you know, being paid off in the afterlife when you, when you make it to heaven. So we have tried to engage our residents to say, we've got to get together, we've got to get on the same page in order for us to continue to evolve, evolve as a community. So there's multiple ways your local city has ways to get involved, whether it's neighborhood cleanups, whether it's mentoring some young folks, going to speak at local schools. There's a lot of folks in our community that the business community, as well as the non-for-profit community, as well as the government sector, can work together to tackle some of the challenges and, in essence, control your own destiny in your respective community. Mm, that's really good. So um, if somebody has had, let's say, a bad experience, they feel like uh, the political realm doesn't care what they think, um, doesn't mean that they should just back off and not try a different avenue. Correct. There are many other ways that they could possibly get involved. I hear you talking about pastors, and I hear you speaking about our need for uh, foundational um, unity uh, related around the Bible. Um, 
you're talking about a holistic approach to building a community. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that's very near and dear to my heart and it's very important to us as a country and us as a community. I think we have our principles that were outlined in the biblical text and it does talk about the importance of government in the Bible and that how Christ created that or how it was created for the purposes of providing a service. So from my perspective, I think it's important to get all those parties involved to tackle the challenges together collectively. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't have the market captured on intelligence. There is folks in our community that have seen and experienced some of the things that we have, but how do we download that information to ensure that the generations today are prepared for the challenges tomorrow? And so I think it's incumbent upon every city administrator, every elected official to say, I want to hear from my community so I, how I can make my community better. Because my father always told me, Jonathan, you don't have to wait till you're sick to get better. We can constantly be improving ourselves. And I think that is the challenge that we want to issue to those viewers at home and those, po those folks in your community is get involved some way, somehow. And if you feel compelled to run for elected office, go for it. We certainly want civic participation and civic involvement with the caveat that you're there to serve your community and it's always about giving more than what you intend to receive back because if you do it the right way you'll be paid forward later on in life absolutely absolutely well you you also touched on just for a second generations how does a city reach out to the multiplicity of generations that it deals with people that have served in world war ii that are still alive in haines city and um, and then the young person coming up wondering, can I find a place to stick in here? Right. Are there ways that, they, uh, that the community can reach toward these younger people? One of the things as it relates to the younger people that I, I've done, I've actually engaged our local area schools. I've, I've spoken at every school in Haines City except for one, whether it's elementary all the way up to high school, and challenging young people to get involved in their government because the power for government resides in the, the public's ability to submit itself to be governed. So the power is really in those residents and those people. So encouraging young folks that you can participate in changing the dynamics of a community. I can tell you that I've interacted with young folks that have come to a commission meeting that have advocated for a park to be open that was gonna be closed and the elected officials sided with the young people. So there is so much impact that some folks can make by getting involved. Those senior citizens in our community, certainly those are folks we want to serve in our senior advisory boards and how do we provide recreational services for seniors in the future. One of the things they talk to us about is that do not call senior centers senior centers anymore. They said with the changing demographics and the baby boomers, they're calling them activity centers. So mm -hmm. we need to be conscientious of how Right now we have five generations in the workplace and how do we provide services for all of those is very important, but we need to hear from the community so we can address those needs and be a all-inclusive community to, to be able to handle what the changing dem demographics and demands are in mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. There are challenges certainly in the dialogue going both ways. Uh, many people might get uh, uh, a little bit... Um, uh, disappointed with what they see on the national scene. They might get disappointed with what they see on the state scene. But a city is different. There's right. a, there's, what makes it a little different as far as that dialogue goes? Well, one of the things that we constantly hear is you hear the rhetoric that happens in, in Washington and Tallahassee. Local government is the government closest to the people. We are in your grocery stores. We are at your churches. We shop and we play at the same places that your family shops and plays. So lumping us all in the same pot, pot in my opinion, isn't necessarily a, a fair assumption, but we want to hear what they have to say. We want to tackle those issues and those challenges because anytime we interact with somebody and tackle their challenge or their issue or change the perception that they may have of government, mm. it adds somebody that's an advocate. It takes somebody that says, well, I don't necessarily I haven't had good interactions with City Hall, but now I can be that person to assist 
in changing the dynamics of my community because I have somebody that listens. And any city manager, any administrator that's not willing to sit down with somebody because of a challenge or a problem or an issue certainly needs to reevaluate why they got into the business because it's servant leadership. It's doing more for your community than what you expect in return. Well, let's speak about those challenges a little bit. We certainly are living in a, a nation that has experienced a lot of divisiveness in many, many realms. Um, and that a lot of it is, uh, is hitting our police departments. Mm -hmm. How can we build better relationships between our police departments and, and uh, open this dialogue you're talking about? One of the things that I certainly would encourage is for folks to understand the challenges that law enforcement uh, is up against. Every law enforcement officer that serves every community, their goal and objective is to return home when they put that badge on when they leave. And so from a community perspective, I think understanding the challenges and the obstacles that they have to go through and the stressors that come with that job, every law enforcement community, I would argue, across the country probably has an opportunity for you to ride along as a private citizen and see what they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. I've had the privilege to ride along with our law enforcement officers on New Year's Eve, and it has been an eye-opening experience mm -hmm. to me as a city manager but also as a resident and also as a taxpayer in this country. But certainly, I think understanding that they are people just like each and every one of us, and they are our, our sheepdogs. They protect us from those wolves. And so I don't think a couple isolated incidents should paint a broad brush of what law enforcement is. You know, you have over a million law enforcement officers in the, in the country, and they probably have, you know, millions of interactions and the media sensationalizes a couple of situations, but there's always two sides to every story. Always two sides to every story. We have just a few seconds left. Um, you, you mentioned biblical perspectives. You mentioned practical ways that we can do different things. Give us one or two final things that can help us unify our, com our communities. We have about 30 seconds. One of the things I think is, is just going to approach those leaders in your community and say that you're willing to help. No preconceived notions you know, civility, the importance mm -hmm. of civility. George Washington mentioned that at the age of 16, wrote a, a clause or a, um, a dialogue as it relates to civility. So respect, understanding people's perspectives and working together towards a time. That's time. great. That's great. We need to respect one another. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with My us pleasure. and sharing Thanks with so us much. both about Haines City and about how we can be involved in our city government. My guest today, Jonathan Evans, who is the city manager in Haines City here in Polk County, right in the heart of Central Florida. Uh, Jonathan, we're going to continue on on our discussions on city affairs with some of the challenges of being actually in public service. So um, just why don't you uh, tell us about public service, that concept. What does that mean? What, are the, what is the spectrum that that could include? You know, one of the things that we commonly see and, you know, the lack of understanding of public service is that it's not just the folks that collect your trash, it's your law enforcement officers, your wastewater operators, it's your city manager. So it is a service-related business. Those folks that are in that profession, I could assure you, are not in there to become rich beyond belief. They're in it because it's a labor of love. And so from a public servant's perspective, we certainly want to serve and leave our communities in a better place in which we found them. So our teachers, our firefighters, our law enforcement officers, all those individuals are public servants that are providing a service to that, to, to that community or, that, uh, or, the, or the region. So public service incorporates and encompass, encompasses a lot of different things. But from a city government perspective, it's everything that you can imagine, uh, how the lights get turned on or how the, um, the wastewater or stormwater is addressed, the challenges that our communities face, 
all falls under the realm of public service and municipal entities as well as county governments. Wow. So, uh, yes, I, I think many times we just see people, perhaps uh, some of the viewers, just looking and saying, well, these people handle this automatically. Well, they have a lot of different pulls on their lives and uh, a lot of different ways that they um, have to be concerned with uh, issues that are integrated one to the other. Um, what are some of the greatest challenges or, or I guess the other side of the coin would be opportunities that you see as a public servant? And maybe let, before we talk about all of them, let's talk about the public servant that you are in your position. Well, one of the challenges as far as city managers, a lot of folks don't understand what is a city manager or if they've never heard of that position. And so when they do find out that the city manager is the, the head or the CEO of a municipal organization, then what happens is they start asking the questions, okay, well, what does this person in fact do? And they run the day-to-day -day operations of the city. In most cases, the elected officials are your policy makers where the city manager runs the day-to-day -day operations. So on any given day, I could be dealing with HR issues, fire issues, police issues, or what have you. So it, it is a constantly evolving situation. It's a very enjoyable job. I, I love the challenges that come along with it, and it's rewarding, but you always have to be conscientious of, I report to five elected officials. I also work for the 22,000 residents. So you're that person in the middle where if things are good, sometimes you're praised, and if things are bad, sometimes you're the, the guy that has answered the questions. <laughs> You know, uh, sometimes in different areas of our community, we get these downpours of water, uh, which can create uh, challenges on our streets and what have you. And, and yet at the same time, we hear people talking about a drought that we could be experiencing. And how does all this, uh, and we hear so much from our city and state that there are water issues that need to be dealt with. Tell us about water issues. One of the challenges that we experience here in the Central Florida area is that the growth here has been exponential. Orlando and Tampa continue to grow. Polk County continues to grow. Well, water is the most precious resource that we do have. And actually on the state level, it's the number one priority for members of our state legislature. What has happened in Polk County, we have formed a regional cooperative to look at issues of addressing water and how do we work together to pool our resources to make sure that we can accommodate the demand and the growth that's happening in our community. Because if we don't have the water to sustain the growth, that impacts economic development, jobs, and every other thing and the like. So we're working together to say, how can we look at pooling our resources where the taxpayers save and we in essence provide that service so it's definitely a critical issue you're going to hear it discussed a lot at the state level and I can assure you that every manager in the region is talking about water and how we work together and make sure that we do not continuously drain resources from the aquifer which most of our water comes from in the state of Florida. So on on the big picture you're dealing with that um, how can a common citizen, so the common citizen feels the rain and says, what are you talking about water? Well, what's the big deal? Um, uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but the water in the aquifer is different than the rain falling on our head. Well, by the time it percolates into the aquifer and then, you know, because we have demands to provide water every day, all day. And one of the things that when we try to relate it to the residents to say, hey, we have water issues, well, as long as they go home and turn on that faucet and there's water there, there's not an issue. But with the growth and demand that we're experiencing in this region, how we handle that resource is, is critically important. So we're looking at ways to promote reclaimed water. Actually also looking at the rainwater that we do get usually gets uh, percolated into the aquifer or makes its way into a retention pond or ditches and swales, there's also discussions about looking to treat that rainwater to make it potable water. So there's a whole bunch of different things that we're looking at. A lot of different ways to go at, to look after at this that. particular mm -hmm. challenge, yes. Let's, let's move from water to one that's on many of our viewers' mind. Uh, certainly as we look throughout the world, we even look in our own nation, we look in our own city, and we see terrorism, we see issues of our public safety that we're concerned with. Um, 
And, uh, but let's talk about those that respond, our first responders, our firemen, our policemen. How can we develop a better dialogue with these people in understanding how to cooperate with their plan on keeping us safe? Well, one of the things that I think with law enforcement, a lot of law enforcement entities have already started the dialogue with the community is how do we work together to protect and provide services to our communities. Uh, law enforcement specifically is definitely open for ideas and suggestions and ways to work because at the end of the day, the law enforcement officer in every community wants to be there to provide service. When people are routinely running away from danger, our first responders are the ones that are running towards it. So it takes a special personality to go ahead and do that. And I can tell you, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of law enforcement agencies and public servants, and those folks are special individuals, and we should not demonize them, but support them. In any job, in any situation, we have to make a call and a gut decision, and they're sometimes thrown in certain ways that they have to react. And so one of the things I think the public should definitely do is engage your law enforcement community in a respectful manner. Hear what they have to say. Deal with their challenges. We even have invited members of the community to go through a simulation as to how a traffic stop is, and it has opened the eyes of a lot of folks to understand what law enforcement is exposed to, sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. So I would certainly encourage folks from the public safety side go to the firehouse, go to the police department, set an opportunity and just say, I want to learn about your business and how I can support law enforcement or understand the challenges and the tackles, the things that you have to tackle in that particular profession. But certainly working together with them as, a, as opposed to the rhetoric that you hear, I certainly think is a better way to solve these problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, so here's a young person. They're they're growing up, they're going through the school system, grade by grade, step by step, and uh, they're considering eventually, well, what am I going to do with my life? And um, how do we raise in their mind that being a public servant uh, might not be a bad idea? Well, one of the things that I, I do, like I mentioned earlier, is I, I love to go to speak to young people at schools and tell them about the profession, but tell them about the opportunities in local government. Local government offers pretty much every degree that you can get from an academic institution, there's a job for you in local government. If you're an engineer, there's opportunities in the public works operation. Uh, if you are an architect, there's uh, opportunities in a architectural review department or what have you. One of the things that I think we need to do a better job is communicating the opportunities that are in our government. With baby boomers retiring at a rate of 10,000 per day, my concern is that there's going to be a huge void of opportunities in the government sector and we need to make sure we have competent and capable minds to fill those positions because the community still need to function and need to operate mm -hmm. so certainly engagement from the administrators perspectives going out there recruiting the best and brightest talent is something that we should do and advocate for mm -hmm. but there is a litany of different job opportunities jump on your local city's website read the job descriptions or if you're interested in the profession that you say hey I want to be a city manager just go to the website and look at what the credentials that that city manager has and then follow that path that's exactly what I did and it's you know it's end up working out for me mm -hmm. so what are some of the uh I mean, it seems obvious what some of the challenges are for a police officer. Um, what are some of the challenges for a first responder, fireman, paramedic? What are, what are some of the things they have to deal with? One of the challenges that they have is when they arrive on scene, the lack of communication that's occurring. Usually what happens is maybe there's a, a issue that has arised. And when they get there, they're looking for the patient. They're going to treat that patient. But ultimately, they're also trying to help find out what happened or what got into this situation. And sometimes you don't have the participation from the community to help provide some of the backstory so we can bring that situ situation to a resolution. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that we're also experiencing is the lack of diversity in our fire service. We have tried to diversify our fire service as well as our law enforcement entities to make sure it's reflective of your community. You want to have your workforce reflective of your community, mm -hmm. but it is hard to recruit some folks into the profession. So 
from the fire side and the police side, recruitment and retention. And, and one of the concerns I do have is, you know, with some of the remarks you're hearing on the national level is how do we encourage that young person that's considering police or fire services to get into the business, but the public perception about that that particular profession is not the best. Yeah. So we need those first responders. We need those people to come into the profession because, you know, I routinely say that, you know, a firefighter is the only person that can show up at your house at two o'clock in the morning with an ax and you're happy to see them. <laughs> so we need those <laughs> folks there to provide that service for our community. Right, and and firefighters in, in many ways, uh, that whole industry has changed. They mm -hmm. do a, probably a ton more emergency Absolutely. medical than mm -hmm. they actually do. Um, Absolutely, about 70% of the call volume that we experience in our community and most communities um, experience our emergency medical calls. So we have to be prepared to provide that life safety service or that va advanced life support and so what we need to do is look at how can we traverse our roadways and that's where it goes in the infrastructure the other side is making sure that we can get from point a to point b in a reasonable time because mm -hmm. seconds do save lives so mm -hmm. certainly when i tell anyone when you see a first responder on that roadway please yield to whichever side of the road so they can go because seconds mean something to that particular family member that's looking for the services mm -hmm. that we provide Without necessarily unpacking the details of it, um, what would you say are the, the top three uh, issues that are, a fa that are facing Haines City um, or even Polk County in, uh, in the next five years? I think the top three issues certainly would be economic development and growth. Okay. How do we accommodate water? How do we provide for that growth and that development? And then ultimately, the changing and our demographics with the workforce changing with the um, population becoming a little bit older how do we prepare for those services in our community so it's the constant evolution of of our communities and so it's very important that we're cognizant and we're aware of the situation so we can plan for that in the next three to five to ten years that's really good well, I appreciate you being with us today, Jonathan, and helping us understand how city governments work and county governments work, and more specifically, how we as citizens uh, can be involved in our city, um, can understand the challenges that you have, and uh, how to cooperate one with another, uh, not just with respect, but also with great ideas in, uh, in serving one another uh, going into the next five years. Uh, certainly water, economic growth, and the change of our community, these three elements that you mentioned, uh, will have a drastic uh, uh, impact on us as we move forward. Developing a little unity wouldn't be bad either as we fight these, uh, fight these things. Thank you again for being with us. Thank it's you. Uh, been our honor. Thank you so much. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.